Hey y'all, happy Sunday, hope everything is going well for you and yours. This is the portion of the show where we let YouTube send out the notifications via social media, let folks know that the broadcast is getting ready to start. We'll sit here and we'll count down the next two minutes before I push that button and go live. If you happen to be watching this on replay, go ahead and scrub past this graphic until you see my smiling face. If you have any questions and you're joining us today in the live chat, feel free to go ahead and add those questions to the live chat now and we'll get to them in due course during this live Q&A session. So, sit back relax, grab a beverage, and we'll get going in about 30 seconds. Hey y'all, happy Sunday. Oops, I forgot to move the broom and dustpan out of the way. Oh well, no big deal. <laughs> hope everything's going good for you and yours this morning. Uh, hope all is well and um, that we're ready to get going. So um, a little behind the scenes thing going right now. I'm right in the middle of one of my bi, well it's not biannual, what would you call it? Every six months. I have a sinus thing with all the tree pollen and everything going on. Uh, the rain that we get here in Southern Oregon beats the heck out of the trees and any loose pollen, it shakes them out and I react. So if I sound like an asthmatic duck today, that's why. I'm better today. Yesterday, this voice was so husky, it could pull a dog sled. So... Hopefully, everybody can understand me all right, and I don't sound too awful bad. Um, this morning's video went live. Um, in fact, I had somebody here who said, uh, Jim Brown said, thanks for getting up early to post your video. I don't get up early to post the videos. I upload on Thursday when I set up this live stream, and I schedule it to go live at uh, 7 a.m. Sunday morning so folks can maybe you know on the east coast can wake up and enjoy me with their coffee yeah right and uh, but that's 4 a.m. here on the west coast I am not up at 4 a.m. not not by choice anyway so um, yeah that's all scheduled behind the scenes but thank you for that and I'm, I hope it was uh, a help to you um, let's see in getting into this, uh, let me find you. Rob Schuster said, did some dummy not know how tool names work? He asked that because he was one of the people who asked a question. Um, and yeah, a dummy didn't know how they worked. And that was me. Um, a good portion of what you saw me fixing with the ball nose bits was me not knowing what I was doing back in like version nine. And as I added ball nose bits, I would just whatever's in there. I don't know what all that gibberish is. I don't care about all that gibberish. So I would enter, just erase everything in that format blank and enter the name of the tool. And off I went and I kept having to add all of the parameters to each tool as I bought a new bit not realizing what the 
naming convention was and what the format was. Well, as I said before, in one of these live streams, I don't remember which one, it was a couple back, I saw that mentioned just in passing in one of Vectrix videos or in one of the presentations for, and I don't remember if it was 2020 or 2021, the worldwide user, user group meeting. They just kind of mentioned it in passing. And I thought, well, wait a minute. That needs some exploration because it's not something that most people recognize or even know about, me included. So I decided to go ahead and dive into it and just happened that I got a couple of questions about it from Rob and a couple of other people. And it dovetailed right in. The timing was perfect. So ta-da, you got today's video. And I hope it helps, folks. Uh, it was more than just for standardization and uniformity as far as the names are concerned. It was more for adding bits, making new tools easier to add. Because it's like I demonstrated in the video, it's just down to copying something very similar, changing a few parameters, you know, the dimensions or what have you, the diameter of a, of a tool, and you're off and running. So, and I had a couple of questions in the video comments. Uh, let me get down and find it here. Um, let's see, gotta find it. Where did it go? Come on, get me down to my comments. There we go. Uh, one of them was, oh, come on. Um, let me find it. Come on, where it is. Okay. Um, Bill Nebergall asked, on my Amana tools, I like to have the part number with it to keep tracking them. Is there a good way of doing that? And my basic answer to that is, let me go over here and get Aspire up. Okay. Um, what he's talking about is getting into the database and let's say for, okay, this is, a, this is a good aside here. I updated my database in the video and I uploaded it to the cloud. I just started up Aspire on this computer and it's telling me that the tool database is out of date. Remember in the video, I uploaded the new database to the cloud. So now it's asking me, do I want to update? Let's go ahead and click yes. This will overwrite the tool database. Yes. Wish to continue. And now it's updated it. And there is the 3 16 end mill that I added in the video. And there's the 3 8 end mill I added in the video. So perfect timing. Uh, what he was referring to is, let's say on the quarter of an inch end mill, it's an Amana tool part number XYZ123. Yes, you can get in and you can add that here at the end by giving it a space and then typing in a mana tool, what have you. And that's fine to do that. The problem I find is that if I do that, I end up with three or four different quarter inch end mills when basically they're all the same to me. Now, what does make a difference is if I have a two flute quarter inch end mill and a one flute over inch in, uh, quarter inch end mill. So for that case, what I can do is come up here and in this format, let's see, we'll click in there, space bar, right click and geometry. Let's add number of flutes. So, and then another space, and I'll type in the word flute. There we go. So now, end mill, quarter inch, two flute. And I'll update all of my existing end mills, 
Update 20 exists. Yes, update all. And boom. Now, some of these don't have a flute, number of flutes listed. And that's giving me the warning. So if I go in and get that, let's see, that was a two flute. Apply. And there we go. So that's giving me the warning that I don't have a number of flutes entered. So I'll need to go through and change that and add those for all of those different little bits. I no longer have these two bits. I broke them long time ago. So rather than sit here and bore you with that, um, that's just letting you know that you can put as much criteria in here as you want to. And, but again, the more you do, the harder it is to see everything. Now you can, you can make this a little bit wider and that will help. And if you don't mind that filling up more of your screen, there you go. And all I did was put my cursor over here on the edge and you see how it turns to the two sideways arrows click and drag to make that wider. Generally, what I end up doing, if I want the tool number to be associated with that bit, is I'll use my notes area down here. That's where I'll put a tool number, I'll put a link to the website, uh, whatever, a link to the page that I ordered that tool from, I tend to put that kind of information down here. And it's just basically to kind of keep this uncluttered. So that's the kind of thing that I would do there. But yes, you certainly could get in up here and just over here somewhere type with, that, with no brackets, put the uh, Amana tool number in and uh, you'll be all set and ready to go. So let me go ahead and cancel. I want to discard all changes because I didn't want to do that with the flute. So I don't, I don't want to do that. So I uh, hope that uh, answers that question. So let's see. Um, now, Boris Gutman, you asked about this, I think, either on Facebook or in um, a comment. Uh, can we change the picture in the tool database so we can match it with the bit that we're adding? And let me go back to sharing here. And let's see. Uh, pull it up. Let's see. Tool paths, tool database. If you are referring to this icon right here, I don't know of a way to change that. There may be a way that I'm just not aware of, but if there is, I don't know about it. Now, like if we take this point cutting round over bit here in the form tools, it will show you a diagram of the tool. If that's what you're referring to, it takes this diagram from the vector you use to enter this form tool into the tool database. Now, uh, but as far as changing these icons over here, I'm not aware of a way of getting in there and doing it. Doesn't mean that you can't, it just means that I'm not aware of how to do that. So, I'm sure somebody out there in the developers uh, community would know how to uh, get in there. So, so let's see here. Um, let me take that down. Uh, let's see. Is anyone else's video and voice all out of sync here? Uh, you might need to reload the page or you look down at the, um, the video pane right next to where you set the volume, there should be a red LED looking with uh, the word live. If that's gray, click on the word live and it'll jump forward and update everything. But you may end up having to reload the page. So let's see. Um, Paul Coffey says two things as important to know about a tool are its length and diameter. Yes. 
the flute length and while the diameter is basically set by uh you enter that into its cutting diameter but yes it's it, your point's well taken i tend to put stuff like that in the notes like i don't know if you noticed i had on a, a one of the bits that i was showing when i was screen sharing it had a 0 0.090 long flute length that's the cutting depth. That's the max cutting depth of that bit was 90 thousands. It's a very tiny, tiny bit. And I promptly broke it the first time I used it. So <laughs> I had delusions of grandeur about three weeks after I got my machine up, my first machine up. So uh, let's see here. Thomas Grimm says, perhaps, perhaps this comes in a part of today's show I haven't seen yet. How do you deal with different types of quarter inch end mills? Upcut, downcut, compression, straight. Um, this is just me, but I treat in the tool database in that context, I treat um, upcut and downcut the same. They both run at the same feed rate, they both run at the same RPM, they both run at the same plunge rate. The only difference is the direction of the chip evacuation. So I don't add any other bits. I don't differentiate. Um, when it comes to a, like a single flute or a straight cutter, uh, not a spiral, um, I don't differentiate them either because in the context of the tool database, the tool database doesn't care. If I know, for instance, I'm going to use a single edge, uh, single flute or two flute straight bit, if I know that I'm going to be using that, I will take that into account when I'm calculating the tool path that runs about the same feeds. The only difference is I have to make sure I ramp in my plunge moves because there's no cutter across the bottom. But I know that in my head as I'm doing the... Uh, as I'm, as I'm creating the tool path, but that is a case where you could go in and again, copy the tool and make a separate tool for upcut, downcut, compression, straight, if you really want to. I mean, it's your tool database. You put as much or as little as you want in there. And that's where that number of flutes comes in. That'll help you on that score. Um, I keep saying I don't like anything more than a two flute bit. Well, I found a couple of exceptions to that. Um, my um, 60 degree V bit, it's a CMT 60 degree V bit, half inch diameter. And that sucker's got six flutes on it. I have to slow it way down, but it cuts like a champ. Um, so I have that marked as a separate tool number. And it is a six flute bit. Um, I do have some uh, single flute cutters. And, um, but I don't treat them really any different. So I, I just know going in, in my head, when I'm calculating this tool path, okay, I'm using that uh, straight bit, doesn't have a cutter across the bottom, ramp in the plunge move at at least three times the bit's cutting diameter. That way, the forward edge clears away the material. It doesn't get up there and bottom out on the bottom of that bit where there is no cutter. But as far as the, um, as far as the tool database, one's as good as the other. I mean, now again, you're welcome to add them separately if you wish. That's 100% your choice. So I hope that helps. Um, let's see. Cruise back up here and let's see. Um, well, I don't see. I'm, I'm, I'm looking back at some of the early, early questions and then, okay, okay, all right. No, I'm not seeing any other old. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Bob Frail says, do you know if it is possible to add a tool type to the list? For the example, I would like to create a tapered ball nose type separate from my existing ball nose. Yes, it is possible. 
I just don't remember right off the top of my head how I did that because I did exactly that. I think I copied the group. That's exactly what I did. I copied the ball nose group and then renamed it tapered ball nose. And that's what I just entered my uh, tapered ball nose bits in that group. Let me jump over to Aspire again, share screen and bring it up here. Okay. Tool paths, tool database. Okay, I'm in Imperial Tools. Let's just say for giggles. Uh, now, I already have a tapered ball nose category. So I'll call this one something else. I just select that group, then come down here. Uh, let's see, is that it? Now, I've got that in the way now. Let me hide this. I think that's, no, that's not, that's import. Yes, copy the selected group. So if I look now, I have two ball nose groups. So now here I can click once. And let's see, how do I? I don't try to remember how I got in and edited that group. How did I do that? There is a way. Hide unset tools, hide groups of incompatible tools. Uh, I don't remember how I got in and renamed it. Hmm, boy. Okay, never mind. Here's what we, let me go ahead and remove that. I, I goofed up. I goofed up. I didn't copy the group. There it is right there, add a group. So add a group, here's the new group, but I put it within the tapered ball. Boy, Mark, you're just really... That in a thousand, yes. Imperial tools. Add a group. There it is, new group. Now I can call this. All knows two. What? No. Come on. Oh, there it is. Boy, Mark, you're batting a thousand. This is why I tell you folks, I am not an expert. <laughs> I'm going to just put temp in here, apply, and there we go. So I have my ball nose group right there. It's this icon here. It's nothing to do with copying. I apologize for that. Oh, boy. Okay. So, and in fact, now that I don't want that there, uh, I don't want to keep this because I don't want to fill up my database with tools that I don't have. I'll go ahead and delete that. Just chuck it. And then speaking of which, I'm going to come down to this 3 sixteenths two flute bit that I added in the video. And right here, I can either click remove here or remove down here. I'll go ahead and click it right here because I'm right there. Yes, it will remove the cutting data for one item and one tool. Yes, I wish to delete it. I don't actually own it. And the same thing here. I don't have that 3 8 inch bit. I just did that for the video. I'll remove. Delete. Okay, that just removed the, the uh, data. Now I can remove the entire tool. Okay, there we go. So now... This database is correct, and it is up to date. Now I'll go ahead and I'll upload it to the cloud. Yes. And wait for it to upload. Okay. So now when I go back inside, my uh, edition of Aspire inside is going to be the correct edition. So sorry about the... Uh, tail chasing down here but yes you can add a new group which is a different tool type that's how i added the thread milling tools up here and that's how i added the tapered ball nose down there so i hope that helps you i apologize for the for the uh run around now let me get back over to where you folks are and uh 
See who's laughing. There we go. Yep. Martin Pearson. Exactly. Second icon at the bottom. Um, let's see here. Um, what is the function of a one flute bit? Um, well, it's the same as a two flute bit. Basically, a single flute bit is kind of a cheater's way of slowing down RPMs on a router or spindle that you cannot slow the RPMs down on. For instance, if you are cutting acrylic, you don't want to run your RPM super fast. So using a two flute bit would build up heat just enough to melt that acrylic and let it either fuse itself or weld itself to the tool or just weld itself back to the acrylic you're trying to cut through. So like, for instance, in my case, I'm using a Porter Cable 890 series router and it will slow down to uh, 12,000 RPM and that's the slowest it'll go. With a two flute bit, that's what will happen. It'll build up too much heat and that will cause that acrylic to melt and stick to the bit and to the edges of the cut. By using a single flute bit, you have a flute cutting into the material half as often as a two flute bit. And if you use an O flute bit for acrylic, the O stands for open. It's got a wide open channel to evacuate them chips and that heat out of there fast. It's got flutes that more, uh, a single flute that more resembles a drill bit than a end mill. It's very deep, very wide open. So it'll evacuate that chip out of there and take the heat with it. So single flute bits are used very often for acrylics, um, aluminum, uh, other metals that can get sticky or gummy if heat builds up in it. Um, let's see, uh, from like a countertops, I mean, all kinds of different uh, applications for a single flute bit where you, you don't want to build up the heat and you can't s slow your router down enough to prevent that heat from building up. So let's see. Uh, Thomas Grimm says, the reason I asked was because I think it would propagate onto the setup printout for future use when I've forgotten which one I used. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, Thomas is talking about adding the Amana tool number, for example, to the, um, to the name up there in the format window. And you certainly can. That's all I was saying was be aware that it might be easy to pick the wrong bit if you have information shoved way back off to the side. That's all. So, yeah, you can certainly do that if you want. I mean, it's your database. Make it the way you want it. But, yes, that would be handy information to have on a, uh, onto the um, job sheet printout. So let's see here. Um, let's see here. Uh, Paul Coffey's a hundred percent accurate here. Um, a word to the wise here is that tooling can become very technical very quickly. Oh, we haven't even touched on helix angles and things like that. Um, you know, it's, um, it's a it's a science and an art of its own i'm here to tell you and i'm just not that much of a uh of a uh, tool nerd to get involved in that i don't do the kind of precision that requires it you know i'm basically a wood guy i'm a woodworker if you're machining metal yes you have to get technical about it you have to be concerned about uh the tip angle on a drill bit i don't i'm a wood guy you know, it, half of my bits don't have an angle on them. I mean, it just plows through and I'm, that, I'm good with that. So, <laughs> you know, uh, let's see. 
Oh, okay, Bob. I I apologize. You were talking about create will creating a new group. Give me that selection in the drop down when I add a new one. You know what? I don't know. Let's take a look. Um, that was a mistake. Uh, we were talking about adding a new group. Um, and he's talking about, let's go over here. He was talking about, come along. All right, go ahead and I'll add a group and we'll call it all nodes two okay all right now it's at lips uh, that was dumb i'm just used to hitting enter so now i have this it doesn't know what kind of bits they are and it won't it will depend on what kind of bits you add so if i want to add a new tool to that database I have to tell it what kind of a bit it is. Okay. Now, if you're asking, can I add new categories here? I don't think I can. I'm not sure. Um, let's take a look here and see what I can do. Um, no, that's just going to let me do an end mill. It's... See, if I get in here, no, that's just going to make it end mills. If I get in here and go with engraving bits, it's just going to allow me engraving bits. I don't know if you can change these. I don't know if you can. Tell you what, I'm going to all, uh, hmm, I'll get a hold of uh, some folks over at Vectric and see is there a way of getting in and changing this without getting into the back door of the, of the, uh, of the uh, software and causing myself any pro myself any problems. But let me go over here and look at what you're saying. Maybe there is a way. Um, yeah, Michael's talking about it. I doubt it because it has to use the algorithm from the software. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that is uh, going to make it. So... Yeah, um, generations, custom creations. Um, yeah, and you saw that I did answer the question. One of the videos I'm going to do later on is the um, some of them I'm going to do a little bit later on it is talking about the difference between a no flute bit, uh, single flute, two flute, three flute, six flute, all that other good stuff. So um, I'll, I'll get a little bit more into it because not all low flute bits are for acrylic. Some are made for aluminum. Some are made specifically for acrylic. And the differences are subtle. But as was discussed earlier, some of it could get real technical real fast. And this isn't the place for it. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Martin Pearson, if what he's asking is can he add a new group? called taper ball nose then add taper ball nose bits then the answer is yes yes that that is that is what uh he was asking but um now bob you oops it jumped bob you say um i have tapered ball nose in my drop down and you do not i don't know why that I'm going to have to go back through and take a look because I don't remember adding anything like that. Um, I think maybe when I created that taper ball nose group, it was added. I don't remember. It's been a while. And uh, so if I add something and then forget about it for nine months, it's gone. So uh, let's see. Let's see, Richard Kenton says, why do I see a small black square next to some tool paths? I see it in the stack text project. That's because I went up in the preview window. And let me cancel that, get out of that. And we'll share. 
and I don't have any files here that I can demonstrate this on, but I can show what um, Richard is talking about. And that is over here in the toolpath tab, go into the preview screen. I don't have any toolpaths created. Um, there we go. That's what I was looking for. I don't have any toolpaths created down here, but on some of them in that, uh, in that one particular video, you saw a little black square next to the name. That has to do up here with changing the toolpath color. When I change a toolpath color, and I use black in my videos because it's something that's high contrast so you can see it on video. When I change the toolpath color, and then it will put that little black square. If I chose blue, it would be a little blue square. So that's all that is. That's letting me know that that toolpath is that color. So I hope that answers that question there. So let's see. Yes, Rob, I knew that was you. I knew that was you. I just, when, when I see a name, um, I try to use that name because it's a vocal as well as a visual thing. And folks can see yours. So, uh, let's see. Okay, see, Paul Coffey says, I actually thought you were joking about a zero flute bit, as in what's the point of having a cutter if it doesn't have a cutting edge? No, O, o flute is, O is different from zero. An O flute bit, the O stands for open, because it is, it's wide open, it's a channel, and you can't miss it. Um, whereas, yeah, zero flute bit, I don't know that one. Well, yeah, they do exist. They call those grinding wheels. The uh, little burrs, excuse me, a little abrasive burr. But I wouldn't use that in a router. Boy, you know, that would be a nightmare. <laughs> so let's see here. Um, let's see now. And it looks like that I am caught up with questions. Let's see here. Oh, okay, yeah, there you go. A 180 degree V bit. Yeah. Well, in a manner of speaking, no, that wouldn't be it. That wouldn't be it. Just, just for giggles, um, Michael. What is the uh, largest angle you have on your bits? Do you, I mean, my largest is 90 degree. Do you use a 120 degree bit? I mean, I would imagine that would be for some huge text. And I could see where that would come in handy. But do you use one? Have you ever needed one? So there's a, yeah, you know, Paul, don't worry about it. I mean, nobody knows. I had to go back and research all of this. <laughs> Let's see here. Russell Faraday. Can I add a group for ball and end? I don't need a group to tell me it's a mill. What else could it be? A ball, banana, perhaps. You certainly could if you wanted to. And in fact, you can go in and edit the name of that group and just call it ball or end. You know, um, yeah, you can do. Like I said, it's your database. You do with it what you want. So, you know, it, it it's 100% up to you. Just make it easy for yourself to remember. I mean, I, I, have, I did bring it actually out today. Brought out a notepad with a pencil. Um, I, just because I, I have to make things easy. I can't rely on my memory. So that's why I write little notes in that note section because I need to use those notes. Because I won't remember that this tool only has a 90 thousandths um, um, flute length and max cutting depth. I may not remember that. So let's see. Michael Mazalik also, he says, yes, he has 120 degree. And he also uses a three and a half inch ball nose. Uh, there's a gentleman. I cannot remember his name. He's in Colorado. 
Nice guy. Very good guy. He used to call himself DJ Light. I don't remember what he changed his name to. He does a lot of sculpted wall panels with a three and a half inch ball nose. And oh man, is it ever cool. <laughs> this guy does fascinating work. He makes uh, sculpted wall panels out of um, high density urethane and puts them up in, you know, buildings and uh, office buildings and things like that. And it's really cool to watch his CNC in action. He's got a big, huge professional CNC. I think it's a 10 by five. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Mark, if you wanted to use a Sharpie for marking, um, yeah, set up one called, I would put that under specialist tools and call it pen holder. That way you could put any pen in that, uh, in that holder. Sure. Why not? You can put anything you want in there. Well, within reason. I mean, you know, um, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't know that I'd actually do the banana maybe on the rotary axis, but I wouldn't actually do the banana, not in the spindle. God, that would be a mess. <laughs> uh, see, Jeff uh, Woody Wan says he uses 120 degree V bit for three and four inch numbers on house signs. It makes it very easy to read. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I had in mind too. It'd have to be large text, and you're not you don't have to cut deep. You just have to cut big. So if it can do it in one pass versus three or four, might as well. I just haven't had the need for one yet. Okay, I was just curious. Okay, here, looks like we're all caught up with everything. Um, Dave Blackburn is asking any shop updates. Um, I got my electrical chase panels painted. Uh, they're installed. Uh, corner moldings are in. Um, I can kind of give you a little bit of a preview here. Uh, boom, electrical chase is in over here along uh, this wall here. And I got a, I put a cove molding in that corner all the way around and got it all painted and touched up and everything. Let me push that back down to get rid of the glare of the lights and flooring's in baseboards in. I've got a little bit of caulking to do around the baseboards here basically where the grooves in this uh t111 these vertical grooves basically where the uh, baseboard meets those grooves is a haven for bugs and spiders and junk and i want to keep that out of there so i'm gonna i'm just gonna use some clear caulk i don't care if i can see those grooves but i just want to use some clear painters caulk and get those covered and then i'm ready for the move um, that's kind of why you see the broom and dust pan out. Uh, it's I'm cleaning all of this up so that I can get a hold of my, uh, nephews and get the machine and toolbox moved. Ah, very observant bill. Yeah. Right there. That is, I said something earlier uh, in the chat here, just hooting and hollering with some of you guys. Uh, about I'm in love with the insulation here. I walked out this morning. It was 46 degrees. This is a little, one of those little oil filled radiant heaters that, you know, it doesn't have a fan on it or anything. It just, you turn it on, it heats up oil inside and it's a little radiator. I also have a quartz heater over here off to my right side. I didn't even turn that on this morning. Like I said, it was 46 degrees. I came out at about 10 o'clock, fired up the computer, make sure it didn't need to update, turned on that little oil-cooled heater, went in the house, came in half hour later, and I shut that heater off because I broke a sweat just going from the door to the computer. This insulation, I'm a major fan. I am a major fan. I don't think I've run a heater in here. In fact, I'm going to take this quartz heater out. I don't think I've run a heater in here longer than about a half hour, 45 minutes at the most. It is really, this insulation, I'm a major, major, major fan with every penny. So air conditioning, not so much. Air conditioning, you do have to keep it running. But 
even in 115 degree heat down here this summer, I kept it 72 in here and it was just fine. So I, I'm, I'm madly in love with the closed cell spray foam insulation because if I can run, if I can heat this entire shop on that in, you know, like I said, about a half hour, 45 minutes, I'm a happy guy. I had to shut it off. Okay, let's go ahead and end this. Um, next week is going to be open Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions about anything, life, the universe, anything, whatever, uh, bring them along. And um, the video after this may be the final interior shop update for a while. Because after, as I say, after I get this caulking done, I'm going to get a hold of my nephews and we're going to move the CNC. But that's going to be in a different video because I have big plans for that. I'm going to do a video on the actual move itself and then everything I have to do to the CNC after that move. Because I'm going to have to re-level. I'm going to have to uh, re-tram all that stuff. So I'm going to do a video on that because I can't be the only person who's going to move a CNC. It's not going cross country. It's going about 50 to 60 feet, but I'm still going to have to check all of that stuff and make sure me or my nephews didn't damage anything and all the checks to make sure that I'm flat and square. Well, not me, the machine, but you get my point. So next week, like I said, may be the final shop update for a little while. And that won't be next week. That'll be the week after. So uh, also this afternoon at 2 Pacific, that'll be 5 Eastern. Michael Mazalik will be previewing part two of his body parts in uh, Aspire video series. He's going to noses this week. I can't wait for that premiere. I'll see you in the chat. If you have Aspire, you should really be watching this series because faces are probably one of the first things I get asked about. And he concentrated on lips and mouths last week. Noses this week. And I don't know about you, but noses run in my family. See what I did there? We need to know how to do this stuff, and Michael is the guru. So the link to that is down in the description box of this video. I will see you all next week. And until then, go do something cool. Have some fun. Have some fun. Make some chips. But catch you at Michael's video in about eh, two hours. Maybe an hour. Yeah, it's almost one o'clock. About an hour and 15 minutes. You know what I mean. Have a good one, y'all. Thanks very much.